We're coming up on the 10 year anniversary of the PS4's release, and as PS5s become much more readily in stock everywhere, you're seeing prices for these older systems become a lot cheaper. I mean, some major retailers will sell used ones for almost $200, but if you look at a lot of the secondhand used market that you can buy off of other people, you can easily track down a PS4 for as low as 100 bucks. And with how relatively slow this generation has been going, one of the really interesting things about being three years into the PS5 is how much of that library is still available on the PS4 itself. I mean, there are absolutely next-gen exclusive PS5 titles, and we'll round up some of those a little later, but something that's really interesting to me is that with how cheap the PS4 is right now, is it worth picking one up and using it as your main system in 2023 just to play those games that are still getting released across both systems, especially when you consider that you can grab one for basically a fifth of the price of a PS5? One thing I want to shout out to real quick is that not only is this upcoming holiday season the 10 year anniversary of the PS4, it also might be the time that we see some kind of revision for the PS5. There's been plenty of rumors circulating around about that. And that is something that I'm absolutely planning on covering along with some other upcoming PlayStation hardware like the PlayStation Q. And so if you you want to see that coverage, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. So to check it out, I decided to break out my old original launch PS4, the one that I got back in 2013, cleaned it up a little bit, got some dust out of the fans, did a clean install of the PlayStation 4 OS to give it a kind of fresh start, installed a bunch of games that I have that are available cross-generationally on PS4 and PS5, because thankfully digital versions will usually give you a bundle of both of them together, and try those games out to see how they perform. Because I basically have not touched a PS4 since the 5's release, and I gotta say, I'm actually surprised a bit about what the experience has been like. Obviously, if you want to play a game in the best looking form possible, the PS5 is an obvious choice over the PS4. But if your goal is just to be able to boot up a game and play it, the PS4 is actually still more than competent. There's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, some of that is because a lot of these cross-generational games that have been releasing were really intended for the PS4 originally anyways, and then got upgraded versions for PS5 later. But even games that were released later where PS5 was the main target, and the PS4 version takes some noticeable hits visually to be able to perform on the system, still run in a competent and smooth enough way that if your goal is just be able to experience the core content of a game, it's fine. Uh, across a number of different titles that I tried, including stuff like the Resident Evil 4 remake that came out earlier this year, Gran Turismo 7, Horizon Forbidden West, Street Fighter 6, and many of these situations, as far as things go that are important to core gameplay experience, like having a steady frame rate, everything ran perfectly fine. The only two things that you really run into with the experience uh, is the load times and obviously the visual. Now on the visual side of things, again, obviously the best looking experience possible is going to be on newer, better hardware, but a lot of games actually looked better than I feared they would. Of course, this varies a little bit from game to game. Different games scale down in different ways. Uh, and sometimes you will definitely encounter some specific things that look very odd. For instance, when playing Resident Evil 4, uh, some of the texture popping was really bad at the point of some walls just looking straight up PS2 levels of detail. And obviously games running at an internal resolution of 1080p or even lower results in a lot of jagged edges when looking at the closer details of what's happening on screen. But as far as just something that visually looks good, as far as you can see what's happening, the smoothness of the gameplay, the clarity of what it is you're trying to target in a shooter, for instance, uh, all of that is perfectly fine. Uh, load times, on the other hand, are definitely one of the more noticeable potential downsides, which it can be a headache because at the end of the day, sitting and waiting for a game to load can be frustrating. And that is, in my mind, one of the biggest upgrades about current gen systems where they finally moved over to SSDs. But even still running off of the stock spinning hard drive of the PS4, yeah, it takes a while to get into the beginning action of the game. But really, the worst thing in the day is you need to pull out your phone and distract yourself for a minute or so as a game finally gets ready to boot up. Also, worth keeping in mind, my experiences playing these games is based on the original model PS4. And if you look for prices online for a PS4 Pro in particular, where you can open up 4K options or even just better performance versions while still running in lower resolution, uh, prices are not that much higher across the board. You're probably gonna spend another 40 to 50 bucks, maybe even less, only 20 bucks more, which when you compare that to the difference in price between buying one of these older systems versus getting a brand new PS5, it's still quite a bit cheaper. Now, while a lot of these cross-generational games are running great on systems, System. One thing to keep in mind is that we are also seeing some games that are purely next-gen exclusive to PS5. However, that list is not really that large yet, especially considering the fact that we are now three years into the PS5 life cycle. I think we are at a tipping point right now where we're gonna to begin to see more and more games that are next-gen exclusive. Uh, but as far as the stuff that has been coming out this year and what's left for us this year, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but for instance, if you wanna look at what I would consider to be some of the bigger name games out there, as far as things that have been released to date that are not available on PS4 but can be played on PS5, it's just 13 games 
with a couple more on the way before the end of this year. As far as games that are entirely exclusive to the PlayStation ecosystem, at least in terms of consoles, some of these have PC releases as well, uh, there are really only about seven games that have been released so far that are big name that are on PS5 and not on PS4, including Final Fantasy 16, the Demon Souls remake, Ratchet and Clank, Returnal, Astro's Playroom, Last of Us Part 1, Forspoken, and later this year we'll get an eighth game with Spider-Man 2. Meanwhile, if you want to talk about multi-platform stuff with games that are also available on the Xbox Series systems but are not available on past generation consoles, we've got six more major games with Deathloop, Ghostwire Tokyo, Plague Tale Requiem, Gotham Knights, the Dead Space remake, and Wild Hearts. And on the way later this year, we've got three more games, Baldur's Gate 3 coming out at the start of September, Mortal Kombat 1 middle of September, and Alan Wake 2. Another thing that's really interesting about this list, by the way, is that when you're looking at cross-generational games, when it comes to PlayStation, there are much more of them than there are for Xbox. A lot of multi-platform titles have been targeting continued support of the PS4, dropping Xbox One entirely, primarily because of the fact that the Xbox One's base configuration is less powerful than the original model PS4. There's also just fewer of them out there to support as far as just tapping into a market that currently exists, uh, while getting PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series releases on top of that. Some of the very games we've even playing and testing here, right? Like Street Fighter 6 and Resident Evil 4 do not have Xbox One versions, but got PS4 versions that as we've seen through playing them, aren't necessarily the best looking way to experience these games, but run them perfectly fine as far as just allowing you to enjoy their core content. Now again, I think we are at a little bit of a tipping point here where we're gonna start to see more and more of those games that are purely next-gen exclusive, uh, getting this far into the life cycle, and I think finally fully bouncing back from the slowdowns and delays that happened during 2020. But even with that in mind, looking at how currently up-to-date the PS4 library is and seeing how relatively few titles are being missed out on, I think there's a really intriguing argument here for if someone just wants to be able to play some of these console games and has been holding off in a system and a four or $500 system with a brand new PS5 is just much too out of reach. Picking up a regular PS4 for 100 bucks or spending a little extra for a PS4 Pro but still not getting anywhere near the price of a PS5 is something very tempting. When talking about the games available across both these systems too, I think another important thing to point out is how strong third party and indie libraries have gotten as time has gone on. A lot of the stuff that is completely exclusive to next gen are those bigger AAA level titles that are focusing on having the most polished, the best looking visuals possible. While a lot of smaller games and especially indie games that target retro aesthetics are getting released across both PS4 and PS5 and have no real noticeable major difference in performance. Uh, even with upcoming games like Sea of Stars, for instance, this is an indie game that's targeting targeting a very old school look and aesthetic and runs identically across the PS4, PS5, Switch, and other platforms. And so if you're not even interested in the idea of playing all the latest and greatest big name, expensive, big budget titles, but you just want a way to tap into the PlayStation 4 library and play a lot of these up-to-date smaller games along with past releases, it's gonna be able to keep up with that just fine at a fraction of the price. I also think it's worth pointing out and noting how smooth the OS experience for the PS4 still runs. Uh, I mean, it shouldn't really be a surprise because it's running the same that it has since 2013, which is always solid. There's definitely a more noticeable time booting up a game initially because it's relying on an old school spinning hard drive compared to the PS5. But as far as the snappiness of getting back to the home menu, navigating around there, messing with settings, jumping from one game to another, there's more delays again with launch times, but as far as just getting through the OS and manipulating it, super smooth experience. Really the only thing that feels particularly choppy is launching the store for the PlayStation, which is definitely where things begin to slow down a little bit. And funny enough, also makes sure to have its own little dedicated page to yell at you, hey, by the way, maybe upgrade to a PS5. I will say that because I've also been messing around with the original version of the PS4, it is worth remembering some of the ways that system was weaker than its later replacements, the PS4 Slim and PS4 Pro. Uh, in particular, Wi-Fi, the original PS4 only supports 2.4 gigahertz, which is something I totally forgot about until I connected to my Wi-Fi to try and download some games and saw how incredibly slow it was. Of course, you can still hardwire the system to your internet via the ethernet port, which is exactly what I did and really should be a priority for you anyways, even on modern systems where the Wi-Fi has gotten better. Which, speaking of features and changes between models, one thing that is consistent across all of them is HDR support, which I think goes a long way in making sure that a lot of these games have aged pretty well, having nice popping colors. Really, my main takeaway here is that as someone who just completely stopped using the PS4 once the PS5 came out and having now gone back to experience it, 
while there are certainly some major differences in performance and what the systems are capable of, and there are those exclusive experiences that are only available on the newest system, everything that is available on the PS4 and has had the time put into it to make sure that it is properly optimized for the system is a completely enjoyable and fun experience. And if that's something that you slept on before and the price point of a PS5 is just intimidating to you, this might be one of the best times ever to just jump in and grab one of these systems now and open up a considerably large and still actively growing library. So yeah, that's what the experience has been like using a PS4 in 2023. I know for some people that's just a given because that's the system you're still actively using. I just wanted to highlight, I think, for people that either have been sitting on not picking a system up yet uh, or have moved on to a PS5 and think that, you know, the PS4 is just completely outdated. It's not. It's still a wonderfully solid system and worth playing on. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button to let me know. Subscribe if you haven't yet, and I'll see you guys later.